get started on our very first discussion of HIV in the adult film industry. Um, while we manage some technical difficulties, I'm going to let the panel introduce themselves. Introduce yourself, it's all, it's all about us. Um, hello everyone, my name is Bella Bathory. I am a performer, um, recently started directing. Um, most importantly, why I'm, why I'm on this panel is I work in HIV, I'm a craft navigator. I am a gorilla, crazy person when it comes to combating stigma. Um, I've seen firsthand so many, so many cases of not HIV destroying someone's life, but the stigma of HIV destroying someone's life in this industry. So this is something that I'm very passionate about, very well educated on, and I feel like hopefully at the end of this panel, everyone will leave a lot more educated and everyone will feel better because knowledge is power. <laughs> Good evening, I'm David Holland. I'm a little bit overdressed. Um, and I am the uh, I'm an associate professor in the Department of Medicine's Division of Infectious Diseases at Emory University, and I'm also chief of HIV and STD control in uh, Fulton County, Atlanta, Georgia. Hi, I'm Charlotte. Um, I'm a performer in the adult industry, and um, I just want to help break down the stigma and. Uh, help educate people so they'll be less afraid because it's not really such a scary thing. Also, I'm getting married in three weeks to a crossover performer, and it's pretty great. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Hi, everybody. So I've, I've taken up a microphone now so I can yell better later. My name is Matthew Rose. I am the Policy and Advocacy Manager at the National Minority AIDS Council. Yeah, it's a lot of words that don't really but uh, I have worked in this field for over a decade. I do policy research advocacy, and I'm actually very excited to be here in front of you because as a man who's devoted his career to ending the epidemics, um, all the work that I do pales in comparison to the reach that you all can have. Uh, you all set standards, norms, and teach people things more than you ever know. And if I can get even a couple of you to come fly the flag and help me out, uh, I will be winning in my battle. So thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being here. Uh, if you have complaints, send them to Eric. <laughs> we take comments in the Reels on a Cash app. We'll give it to you later. So I'm personally excited that there is a technical difficulty because that safety you're having to give you the embarrassing picture of me and my escargot tongue. So it saves you from my bad, bad humor to get started. So thank you, Eric, for that later. All right, but go ahead and get started with um, questions about what is HIV? How is it transmitted? How is it prevented? And what is this magic prep and task thing that we all keep hearing about? So I'll ask Dr. Holland to take that one. Yeah, so, um, you know, HIV is a viral infection that is transmitted through various ways, but, you know, um, most relevant, I think, to this community is through bodily fluid exchange. And so, um, you know, pretty much any, well, it pretty much takes um, some sort of insertive sexual activity to actually transmit it. So, um, uh, and, and obviously, uh, receptive partners are at greater risk than uh, insertive partners. However, um, insertive partners are at risk, just lower risk. Um, and uh, it can be transmitted through things like oral sex, although that is extremely rare. It's like really rare, like case reportable rare. Like so rare the CDC can't even calculate what the risk actually is kind of rare, but it's been reported. Um, but, you know, the, the major ways that it gets transmitted are, um, you know, penis and vagina sex and penis and you know, uh, the butt sex, so. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, yeah, crap, okay, yeah. So, anyway, obviously, you know, the ways that we've traditionally um, recommended prevention is uh, through condoms. Um, which are, you know, relatively effective. But more recently, we've had um, a real breakthrough in HIV prevention science. Um, we've, uh, with, uh, with the development of PrEP. So PrEP is uh, currently a 
one pill once a day regimen that is extremely, extremely, extremely effective at preventing HIV. Like, almost perfectly, as in, like, seven people in the world have had it fail when they actually took it. Um, that kind of, that kind of um, efficacy. Um, it's recommended to take just once a day. Um, there are regimens that some groups advocate where you only have to take it from around the time you have sex, um, so that, that's a thing. But it's incredibly safe, um, very, very few side effects, and, and just really very, very efficacious. Actually, we'll take a pause. We did a tech thing. Yay! <clears throat> no FSC meeting is ever complete without a technology, <laughs> technology challenge, so you're welcome. Um, uh, thank you for filling the time while we were figuring out how cables worked. Uh, my name is Eric Loy, I'm the executive director of the Free Speech Coalition. So we obviously started hearing some things. Our plan was to do this in the very beginning because it's a fun, engaging thing of like asking a couple questions. I'm going to let Betty introduce that topic because she has notes prepared. Um, and then uh, I'm really grateful that you're all here. I think this is a really important information conversation. And um, I'm really proud that we're doing this. So, back to Betty. All right. So, if everyone will take out your phone, open up the Twitter, and go to the FSC Army page, and there will be a link for you to hit so that you can start um, the poll. While you work on that, we're going to do a test question. So again, this is where those who don't do teach. So you're going to see my great attempt at being a model, and this is why I, my engagement is on the stage with my clothes on. Um, that is my sexy face. But the question is about escargot tops, which are these fancy little things here, these um, famously and pretty woman. So how many ways can you use escargot tops? Eating snails, nipple clamps, cock and ball torture, or pussy clamps? <laughs> this, is, this is a test question. Use your phone, push the, and we'll see if we can make some magic happen. Oh, did we get me? One big one. Um, yeah. 
Montreal. Okay. They're also <laughs> friends. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it's, one big, it, it's one big study. But the, the cool thing about this was the, the results of that were, it, it also needs to be noted that the study was done on men only. So the, um, the efficacy of PrEP works a little bit different in women. Um, it takes a little bit longer to get into our mucosa. So the intermittent studies haven't really focused on the women quite yet. But as a man, you take it, I think, the day before, the day of, and then two days after. Is that like, that sounds about right? It's 2 one, one. Two, one, one. Okay. Um, and then in addition to PrEP, we also have something called a post-exposure prophylactic. And I, I don't think we have one of these in Los Angeles, but I know in New York and a couple other major cities, they have PEP hotlines. So if you believe that you've been exposed to HIV at any point, like you can call a hotline and get something that protects you retroactively from being exposed. And even in places without a hotline, I mean, you can yeah. access this pretty much anywhere. Um, you just need to do it within 72 hours is the big, big yeah. goal. To go away. Right, so as we have our intermittent not difficult issues, um, how many have had STI? We're almost at 50-50 uh, split, so actually sexually healthier than the general population. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which HIV prevention options have you used? Yes. Place your votes. circulating in the blood and it's not in their bodily fluids and therefore um, if you have sex with somebody like that um, you cannot get HIV from them and Matthew talk about that not that they're the same diseases in any way but similar um, going in remission with cancer correct it's a very similar concept yeah, yeah. 
Um, and then to follow up on Lance's question a little bit, so we use the term U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable. And undetectable by normal standards, I believe, is less than 20 copies per microliter. Is that, is that the? Based, the, the actual definition is like less than 200. Okay. But our modern tests give you down to like 10 or five. And so um, I, yeah, and I know that like, the, the past testing, it's like, I, I think it picks up like five or under. It's um, the, the undetectable status is like much, the bar is much higher in the past testing system. Than so the past testing system uses um, a different kind. It doesn't measure viral load. It looks for um, actual HIV RNA in the system. And it's the same test that's used on infants who are born to HIV positive mothers. So it's, it is. go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. That's, that's a viral load. It's an RNA. Viral load is an RNA test. Yeah. So you can test for it? Yes. Okay, cool. Yes. And, and the past test test for it. Cool. So do you want to give some more background on PASS since you have a lot of experience with it and uh, how it has been beneficial to performers? Sure. So, um, see what, what I can say about this. So um, the PASS system was, I, so I was um, asked a while back, the reason I got involved in all of this is that um, Eric asked me to do some mathematical modeling around the efficacy of the PASS system in preventing HIV. And so um, I worked with a colleague of mine and we looked at really how well the PASS system works. For those of you, I guess most of you all probably know, but for those of you who don't know, um, in the PASS system, um, performers get tested every two weeks for a variety of things. Um, they get tested you know, for um, bacterial, sex, sexually transmitted infections, and um, HIV. And the test that is used for HIV is a viral load. Now, um, in ordinarily, if you just go to the doctor, you're going to get the standard fourth generation HIV test, which is what the CDC recommends. And, you know, that's a pretty good test. Um, in the past, we only used to test for antibodies, and so everybody that was infected would test positive um, for the antibody test. But the problem is that it, it takes um, weeks to months to develop an antibody response. So that's not a real good test if you want to know, like, is somebody been recently infected? The fourth generation antigen antibody tests that we use in the general public now are much better. That cuts the, what we call the window period between the time that you get infected and the time that your test turns positive down to, you know, a couple of weeks. But the viral load actually has an even shorter window period. So it will turn positive even faster. But more importantly, it's also a, it's a direct test of somebody's ability to transmit HIV. So if they're, if they're undetectable on that test, um, they can't transmit, period. So, but we, um, we looked at this um, this question about like, well, what if somebody, you know, got infected the day before they went test and got tested? Like, how, you know, how many people would, would break through and, and, and actually, you know, be infectious in the two-week period before they would be required to get another test to, to stay cleared on the past system? And in our model, we actually looked at um, we looked at gay men because, uh, and we looked at, um, at, at anal sex because that's the highest risk. And all the tops were HIV positive and all the bottoms were HIV negative. Like we really made this hard. <laughs> so uh, all the bottoms were HIV negative and, um, and everybody, uh, yeah, and nobody pulled out. Um, so. Um, it, you know, really the like kind of worst case scenario, but and even under those circumstances, 
Um, and, and of course, nobody got on treatment during this time. Um, even under those circumstances, we had, I don't know, it was like, one or two out of a hundred thousand or something like that. I don't know. It was something ridiculously low. Um, and it was under some extraordinarily complex um, uh, circumstances that that kind of thing would happen. Um, and then, so obviously, they, you know, things that are less risky that, you know, that just wouldn't happen. And I, I should mention, I should mention this before, it, about uh, bodily fluid exchange. It has never, to my knowledge, ever, ever, ever been transmitted by a face splash, getting it in your eye, getting it in a cut, you know. Those were all these things that um, came out of, like, early days of HIV fear. Um, it just, that's just never, ever, ever transpired. So, you know, facial cup shots, things like that, just not a risk. Even if you have a blood-filled syringe and stab yourself with it, that's one in 300, so it's hard. All the sex jokes I can make up in the hard part. So the next one um, is for Matthew Rose. And can we talk a little bit about stigma? particularly when they've come a long way in the treatment of HIV and our knowledge about HIV, and we started talking about U equals U. Um, can you talk about how that affects stigma and how that can affect um, incorporating HIV-positive performers into the industry? Sure. But first, I'm going to stand, because I, I feel a little too Oprah, and I want to be a little more Wendy Williams. <laughs> ah, I laughed, suckers. So, most people in this country remember the 90s. If you don't remember the 90s, please don't raise your hand. You will make some of us feel very old, and we don't need that right now. <laughs> but the majority of you remember the 90s. And that's also when the majority of you use education around HIV stopped. Early 2000s, people stopped dying. We stopped talking. But that moment in the 90s is forever burned in your brain of some scary sex ed video telling you that people are going to die from each other. Who, who's seen one of those videos? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. Mine had this weird camp man person. It was kind of like low, low budget, but I always remember it. Then, we stayed there through the, the, the 90s, the early aughts. And then we had this thing that happened in 2000, and 11. And you're like, Matt, what the hell happened in 2011? I mean, Barack Obama sparks a gun again. That's pretty cool, but what the hell does that do with HIV? Well, the scientific breakthrough of the year, anybody know what that was? Anybody? Anybody? Mm -hmm. Considered the most powerful prevention tool in the HIV toolbox. Prep. Anybody know what it was? Prep? Prep? No? Prep. Ah, uh, not prep. U equals U. See, in 2000, we did this study called the Parker Study, where we followed a bunch of people having sex in South Saharan Africa. And then we said, that's not enough. So then we studied a bunch of more people, mainly gay men, because, well, we gay men have our sex. And as Dr. Holland, we have butt sex, and butt sex is, people tell me, risky. I don't know what that really means. But they had 16,000 cases of sex which is probably not a big number to some of you. But it is still a lot of other people. And then, we went to Australia and had opposites attract, which was more gay men having more sex. And we had some more observational studies. And we all learned one thing from all of these studies, that people who are undetectable, we have had zero cases of transmitted virus, to the point where the world's leading HIV scientist Dr. Tony Fauci, very smart, has honorary degrees from like every Ivy League school. It's kind of like, whoa, dude. Like, maybe be a little less book smart and have a little more fun. Has said it would take thousands of person years, so thousands of lifetimes, for people to find a single point of transmission. And yet, what year is this now? Come on, you know the answer to this one. It's easy. <laughs> 2019. Wait, but when did I say that breakthrough happened? 2011. 
So in eight years, we still have the same stigma and thoughts from back in the days. We have not re-upped our HIV education, I'll get you in just a second, and we have not figured out that literally the most powerful thing we can do is encourage people to stay in care, take their daily pill, and live their life. Question. Okay, you're talking about like, this is like eight, seven, eight years ago. So why are still people suffering and dying every day in HIV? So, stigma is a big reason. I do a lot of work in the South. People don't want to talk about sex in the South. It's impolite to ask people about their sex lives in the South. All of you were born through magical conception, if you didn't know. Strange. As my great friend Mark King likes to say, remember, your mother liked it very bad. <laughs> and that's how you all got here. But for some reason, we can't talk about it. I had a young black gay man, 21 years of age. Every two years, he was completely, <clears throat> took his pills, lived a great life. For three months out of the year, he stopped taking his pills. <clears throat> Risked his health. Why? Because he went home for winter break and he didn't want his family to know that he was taking medication for HIV. I know people who hide their pills in bottles, people who can't get access to care, people who the system doesn't let them stay in care. But we know that care works. It works better than anything we've ever done. It's, it's kind of, wait, I'm sorry, well, there's one thing that might work better, but it has a really high adherence problem. It's called abstinence. So if you can give up sex completely, well, any penetrative sex. So some of you, that might work anyway. But for those of us who like penetrative sex, uh, our challenge. But we can't seem to get it through our heads that we need to update our education about sex. Question. And how much are these medications and are they covered through everyone's health care? Are they hard to get? So, because we know a lot of us mm -hmm. can be afforded and a lot of us don't have health care plans. We have one of the greatest things that the HIV community ever won. We are the only disease condition in probably all of America, for instance, that has an independent program that has money to pay, be the payer of last resort. It's called the Ryan White Program. It's administered through your state health departments, and I know, I know state health departments, not everyone's friend, for lots of reasons. But there is money set aside. Also, all the pharmaceutical companies that produce HIV medications have what they call patient access programs. So if you can demonstrate you don't have insurance, they'll cover it. Furthermore, if you have, say, you had a rough year, you didn't make a lot of income, or you're just, you know, chilling out on Medicaid, because that happens. Medicaid also covers it. Matter of fact, it's actually illegal to not cover HIV medications. Is it too for anybody or any allergies for people? Like, that some people, like, they're interested in that work? So, we have, you, there can be, but this is why when you get tested, you talk to a doctor. I'm gonna actually have to throw it to the doc to answer that part. Are there any allergies or complications when people take this? Well, I, so that's a complicated question, but it, the, the bottom line, the, the two things I would say really quick is, modern contemporary antiretroviral therapy for most people is like water. I mean, it's really very, very safe. It used to be kind of toxic, but now it's very, very safe. That said, you know, with any medication in the world, there's going to be a handful of people that you know have a bad reaction to it. But like it, modern antiretroviral therapy is extremely safe, extremely well tolerated, forgiving. And then, what is the percentage? Like, you know, if you take birth control, it's 99.99%. There's that little percent that you can get it. What is the percentage of if I was to take a pill? Is it 100 percent effective? Or is it, you know, so for PrEP or for treatment? So for PrEP, you need, this is where it gets the, the tricky part. Remember, Shirley was telling you it can change a little bit. So for anal sex, you need to have at least, and don't, some of you are going to look at me and be like, oh man, you let the genie out of the bottle. At least four days worth of medication to get 90% protection. If you have seven days, you get yourself 
to 99. For vaginal sex, you need 20, at least 21 to 28 days, depending on the new study you believe. Um, just because it takes longer to get into the vaginal tissue. It's probably more effective at earlier doses, but that's kind of like the party line on it. Yeah. But the thing, here's the thing about PrEP, is that um, if you take it, and you take it at least, you know, four, five days out of the week, um, it is as close to 100% effective as we can get. Now, nothing is 100%. Literally nothing in medicine is 100%, but it's really damn good. Um, the, you know, there have been a few breakthroughs from people that got infected randomly by somebody who was, had a circulating virus that was in, resistant to the virus. There was been a couple that are just completely unexplained, but the vast, vast, vast majority of transmission events that have occurred in people that are taking PrEP were in people who had stopped taking the pill. Mm -hmm. um, I also just wanted to say like that a big question that I get asked often is like, what are the side effects? What are the side effects? And, it, like nausea, nausea is a thing. You can smoke some weed about it. You can take some Zofran. Um, headaches. But at the end of the day, like you have a pill that you can take that may give you a stomach ache, but can eradicate your chance of contracting HIV. And that's in a very small exactly. amount of people that have any problem with it. The vast majority of people that I put up, I put 600 people on prep. Like I've had one person that had to stop due to side effects. Yeah, and it's not even stopping, it would be just like mild discomfort that I've seen, but it's um, it, it, it's so negligible when you look at the benefits that PrEP offers, like it's completely irrelevant, because I, I would rather have like a little bit of stomach, stomach ache or headache. No. Can, I just want to ask a question to make sure something's clarified. When you answered before about availability of medications, you were talking about HIV medications. I think the question may have been about PrEP. Sure. So I'm going to ask that question sure. now. How available is PrEP? So PrEP, we have yet to see a insurance provider not cover or not cave the pressure from the HIV community about not covering PrEP. We have won battles with <laughs> insurers, employers. We just had this big fight with Publix last year about not covering for their employees. We are very good at this. Uh, it is about to get potentially even better. We will should find out in April about there being zero cost sharing associated with it. But for the majority of people, uh, I, us I usually tell people based on Obamacare plans because most people understand Obamacare plans. If you have a silver level plan, you will have almost no problem paying for it. And at most, you may pay $25. The, comp the drug company that makes the drug has a copay assistance card that I, I am a PrEP user. I pay zero dollars. I just refilled the other day. I pay zero dollars. Um, if you have a bronze level plan, which is the lower tier plan, that depends on what your drug coverage is. But there are programs to help pay for that coverage, help pay for some of that copay from both the company and outside sources. And um, it's a more individual case by case basis. If you have a great PrEP navigator, they know all kinds of cool ways to pay for it. But thus far, no one's not paid for it. But it does cost money. About, it's about $36 a pill, which is about $1,200 a month, $16,000 a year. However, like I said, I don't know a single person who pays that or anything close to that. And I've been doing prep work for seven years now, um, and I've seen most of the cases. And the last little thing on that is, um, when you guys talk about scalp talk about side effects, there was an article three years ago uh, that compared basically taking prep. The side effects from it are basically the same as taking aspirin. Uh, doctors say that there's basically no difference. If you read the fine print on most drugs you take, it says anything that anyone's ever experienced. Roughly the same thing, and the nausea for folks who have no new experience, I tell them to eat some rice, it goes away very late in the morning. Um, and just to talk about like accessibility, I feel like people can really be overwhelmed, and it's really hard to go to a doctor's office and be like, hey, I need prep. Um, I actually had an industry friend who went to go see her gynecologist, 
and um, she was asking them for prep. And her gynecologist talked her fucking out of it. And our medical system is still behind. There is still stigma in the medical system. And she didn't want to go in there and be like, I do porn and I'm in an open relationship and I like to fuck a lot, so I want to take care of my body. And she felt so uncomfortable doing that, she left without prep. But it's 2019 and we have some really incredible advances in technology. One of the things that I've fallen in love with this year is um, there's an app called nurks.com, N-U-R-X, and they actually do prep delivery at home. And so what you do, um, and they take a copay card, so you can like go to Gilead, get a copay card, use your insurance, you can use it with, without insurance, um, you sign up online, they send you an at-home HIV test so that you can make sure that you're negative before beginning treatment, you send that back, and then you get a three-month supply of PrEP shipped to your door without having to go in and speak to a doctor. Um, and that removes a lot of the uncomfortable you know, conversation, it removes a lot of the stigma, um, and NERCS has been really, really sex worker, sex positive friendly, and they are really great at helping navigate um, if you have financial issues. And I just want to add to, Matthew talked about insurance, I think, if you don't have insurance, um, Gilead will, um, the, the manufacturer has a really generous patient assistance program. So, um, if you make less than like sixty thousand dollars a year, then and don't have insurance, then you can get it completely for free. And if you want to know a place to get it near you, there is a great website called preplocator.org that will let you filter for whether you have insurance or not and give you local clinics that are known to provide good prep service. So that's a really good resource. It's the one I like. I, I will say, I've again, I've put 600 people on prep and the one person that we weren't able to get on prep was the public's person and they eventually came, so. Question, is it for working a lot? Can you take any day? Oh yes, it's recommended to take every day. Absolutely. Uh, I had, um, I just kind of wanted to circle back to, um, I noticed in the uh, question submission form, um, a lot of performers are, uh, were curious about the efficacy of um, the past testing system. People are wondering, are there HIV positive performers sneaking into past somehow? Um, what's the, um, you know, how soon does our um, test detect the RNA of HIV? Um, and some people, I think, uh, want to know when the last time there was an HIV transmission on the set, I think. I have all of the answers to this question. <laughs> <laughs> last onset transmission of HIV was in 2004, and it's 2015, or 2019? It's 15 years. It's pretty effective. 15 years, okay. Um, and I know, like, people get so freaked out, like, a performer gets diagnosed, everybody's like, oh my god, oh my god, who was it, who was it? Let me also just answer one of the questions that we got, is like, what does an FSC let us know the name of the positive performer? It's none of your fucking business. Period. <laughs> When, when you say 2004, you're talking about the straight side. Yes. Which is, of course, the only side that has covers. Right, right, okay. right. Um, and, you know, the, the thing about, like, the gay side is that, like, they're, they're educated about this. They know treatment is prevention. They know that undetectable is untransmittable. They don't shun their HIV-positive performers out of the industry. Um, so... <laughs> So if the last transmission was in 2004, um, in the past, I think it was two years, I this this morning. Okay, so the, the last onset transmission was in 2004. Since 2016, we've had 14 HIV diagnoses of people coming into the industry. Those are 14 people who were diagnosed HIV positive that did not enter the performer pool. Um, we also had three performers that were actively performing, tested positive, and the past test, the past test system got it. Like it got it online. So that means in the past like two years, we've had 17 diagnoses, 
zero onset transmissions. That's just, that's over the last two years. Um, and, and the big issue that I see over and over and over again is lack of information and stigma. Like, the stigma is so very real. And one thing that I want to implore to everyone that's here, especially performers, um, I, I know that you have fear, and that, that's a natural response when you want to protect your body. But have a little bit of fucking compassion. Because when you work in the adult industry, all of our bills are paid by fucking on camera. We, when there's an HIV contraction and somebody has to go through that, that is not just like a muggle. That is not a person on the street that, that has to deal with an HIV diagnosis. This is a sex worker whose body has gotten them through everything. Their body pays their bills. And if we can't make room to take care of our performers when they're diagnosed HIV positive, what are we doing to take care of each other as an industry? You know, like people are like, oh, no, I'm fine, I'm clean. Um, I would like to know the entire full panel. And I know for a fact that if someone is HIV positive and undetectable, I can fuck them, I can beat the shit out of them, I can fist them, and I can drink their blood, and I will not contract <laughs> HIV. And I don't have fear because I have education. And I think that that is the huge thing that people are missing. Yeah, I just want to make one comment. Yeah. Uh, your point about compassion within the industry is very well taken, but. Um, stigma is not only un incompassionate, uncompassionate, but it's also dangerous because people will not get tested and will not get the information, will not share the information when they get it. Yeah, exactly. Um, and stigma is one of those things that like prevents us from having open conversations about it. Uh, one of my favorite Chris Rock stands up, stand ups, he's talking about like HIV and stigma, and he's like, I hope that someday you know we can get to a point where you go into work and you're like, oh, my AIDS is acting up today. You know, I want it. Like, I would love to have that be a part of the rhetoric. Like, oh, girl, this herpes breakout is killing me. I'm more concerned with like touching someone with the flu. But we don't shame people. <laughs> we don't shame people for the flu. We don't shame people for having a cold. But you have to look at the reality. The stigma of HIV is rooted in homophobia and racism because it affects the gays and it affects people of color. If this were a white disease, like a straight white disease, the stigma would not be here, and we would have all of the funding, and we would be so kind about it. And so, when you have that fear come up, I, I really, I, I encourage you to look at like where is that fear place coming from? Like, is it coming from a place of knowledge or a 1980s movie like Philadelphia? Like, because that is not the reality of what we're living in today. Do you have a question back in the Yeah, I have a lot two separate databases, um, a regular pass and then a pass plus. And it would be very similar where it's just a performer name, the checks or the X's. And when you opted to go into that system, you are consenting to work with undetectable HIV positive performers. And what we're trying to do with that is like remove the awkwardness, remove like the, the having to disclose every single time and just like 
have all of these people like, you know, Charlotte and Lance who are woke and aware and comfortable sleeping with HIV performers, they will be in a separate system and they will get drastically discounted testing rates. So it's, um, it's a thing in the works. We're still trying to figure out the entire logistics. Um, just to clarify a question earlier about gay people and past, um, when, and trans onset transmissions, uh, when we say there's been no onset transmissions since 2005 um, to the war, um, we're talking about past compliance sets. And some sets, some gay sets are past compliant. So if you're, you're clear in past, it doesn't matter if you're gay or straight, it's on the same, same mark. Um, so uh, like the, the applies to both sides of the industry. So while we're on the subject of stigma in the industry, if you're going to do pass and pass plus, right, is there going to be a stigma for somebody who decides they don't want to be a part of the pass plus working with undetectables, they want to stay in the original pass and work with our current existing talent pools? I mean, it's, it's not stigma. There's going to be a higher testing fee. Like, to eat their own. Do what you want with your body. So why would the testing fee have to be higher for people who want to stay in the original pass versus the new pass plus? Because it's the different testing mechanisms that we're going to be using. It's going to be more cost effective to do it this way. So when it's HIV, you know, I'm on a case of medication, um, and it's undetectable, and you stop taking the medication, it's going to be eventually be detected, correct? Yeah, um, adherence to your, your regimen is very important. How long is it going to be until the person is detectable again? And this is a problem. You work with someone that was undetectable, and then for some reason, people are, I mean, they're like, yeah. It takes, like, it takes well over a week. Uh, okay, but well over a week. Yeah. So well over a week, well, well over a week for it to start coming up. So, I, I don't, it depends on, the problem is that um, it depends on what medication they're on, because our current medications have very long half-lives, so they stay in the body a long time. And so, like, if you if you got a two-week period and you intentionally stopped, like, right on the very first day, um, it'd be you know four or five days before it got out of your system, and then another you know week, ten days. So it would be very unlikely that somebody on contemporary antiretroviral therapy would be infectious in a past window. I mean, I've been in the industry for 15 years, and it's like you, you trust some sort of people, yeah. but also people change. You know? yeah. um, people have anxiety, people like, some people get suicidal, kill themselves, whatever. Um, some people turn because they're irresponsible, and they might be undetectable like three weeks ago, but now they're undetectable, but they're telling them. But then, I, assume, I assume they're responsible or not, and then what happens but, then? but somebody that was undetectable three weeks ago, they're well, outside of their pass window. They're, they're outside of their pass window. The, the pass system that you have to get tested every two weeks. So you're talking about the, the, the probability of somebody having an undetectable test and then becoming detectable in that two weeks. That would be very, very hard to do. And the thing is that, and I'll, I say this too, like current antiretroviral therapy is very forgiving of misdoses. So you can take it every other day. I mean, don't ever do this if you're like, don't, if you're HIV positive, don't listen to this. But like, <laughs> if, 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 like if you, you know, people forget and miss a day or miss a couple of days and then take it again, like it's, that's fine, that's plenty. So you, you really have to kind of work at it. To, so years ago, it was like the producer printed out the test and showed each other the performers. Um, is it better to go back to that system instead of trusting, like uh, put it on the producer to make sure? Look, but is it not with like the past system? Yeah, the past system is it, official. Like just like, log into past. Like that's the safest way. Don't like print out your past stuff. Also, stop posting your fucking past results online because that's what they're getting stolen. Um, but the just log into the past system and look at it. Like, that is what I mean is like, I go to some sets where I say like, you to like, oh, check each other's sets, fine. But you know each other, you're friends, so you're like, sometimes you're scared. Isn't it better to make it like a rule regulation for the well, person who have to 
Uh, so I, I believe even in the, the APAC Bill of Rights, like they talk about this a little bit, like you have a right to see your performer's uh, test results if you're working in a PASS system. Um, you, that is one of your rights. But it's also like, if, if you're coming in there and you're just like, oh, we're friends, this is safe, that's not the other person's fault, that's your fault for not taking care of your body. And my, um... I myself, in the drug industry, right. in order to change, in order not to have any more HIV cases, or more law changes and more problems. I used to have a big studio in a dog, and I lost my studio 28,000 square foot because of the proposition B, because of the condom law, because my studio had to be in LA on. So, um, I kind of was affected by all that. And I so would there be a better type of the regulation that producer has to pull the test, put the liability on the producer, so the talent would just like, you know what, here's proof, that I, I honestly feel like the last thing we need is like more regulation um, than, we, <laughs> than we already have. We need to like clean up the stuff that we have currently. Um, another thing that I want to say is like, if you are genuinely afraid of that, like if you are afraid like of an undetectable person somehow becoming detectable, right? Like, and not you, just like a general you. Um, and if you're really concerned about like interacting with HIV positive performers, you can protect your own fucking body. Like, I have a saying that I like to fuck like I, like someone has Ebola. I like to make sure that my hands are covered. I like to make sure that like all of the things that I have taken um, protect my body. If you're concerned, be on prep. If you're concerned, use a glove before you fist. If you're concerned, have the questions, but like take care of your body first and don't just like put all of the other pressure on another human being. No, but I mean it's... Yeah. Well, I'm going to ask more questions, so I kind of want to... Let me think of it, because we have a lot of people in the room. Just 
because it wasn't absorbed well and so forth. With the modern contemporary antiretroviral therapy that we use, um, the, virus, the, the um, virus doesn't happen. The only way we get um, mutation and resistance now is people that take it, take the medications in a very disjointed manner. It's and, as, and they have to. You almost have to work at it now. It's really, really hard to do. Um, most of the people with resistant virus have been HIV, HIV positive for a very, very, very long time, and were um, taking meds back in the day where it was a lot harder to keep the virus effectively suppressed. But you know, contemporary therapy is just really that good. <clears throat> So I know that we got started a little late, so I've let it go a little late. I know that we're happy to stick around if there are more questions, but I wanted to give anyone an opportunity that we're past time, so uh, didn't want to be disrespectful of your time. Um, yes. I just have a question. I'm a, I'm a director, I'm a performer, and because it's nobody's business and everybody's HIV positive, as you said, speaking for the performers, is it their, are they allowed to know if they're working with a, with a zero load performer? That, that, that's HIV positive. Is that their right or is that not their right? I'm just curious. Before, you're going to get the official answer from over here. I'm, I'm going to put out there, um, the person who's worked in this field, who's worked in human rights in the context of people living with HIV, you don't know the health conditions of most of the people you work with in your life. Um, you don't know when someone has a cold. You don't know when someone has a bum knee. You don't know when someone has a sore back. Uh, if they choose to disclose that, that's one thing. If there is literally no risk to you, you have to wonder why do you need to know? And if you create an environment where someone feels comfortable disclosing. And in a world of HIV where I know people who have been almost beaten to death in the spaces, been thrown out of their homes, thrown out of villages, arrested, served jail sentences, just because of their status, it's really hard for them. And I just want you to think about that piece. If we can get to a world where, you know, the Chris Rock joke is cool, and you're like, oh yeah, HIV's acting up. Um, that's one thing, but we still live in a world where it is still very hostile to people living with HIV for things that are not their fault, that they didn't do, that they have no chance of transmission, and yet people make a whole lot of assumptions about their lives. Um, I just want to substitute everything that Matthew said is absolutely correct, but I also again want to clarify, currently there is no HIV positive uh, performers, individuals, whether on treatment or not on treatment, in the past system, and that has been the regulation since the past system was created in 2011. Now, as we continue to have scientific discussions around uh, how science evolves. Um, we are very aware of the nuance between what it means to be able to have informed consent as a performer, as a sex worker, to be allowed to make a choice um, in all regards, whether you like the sort of or you don't like the sort of So that's incredibly important. At the same time, we're at a crossroads where we want to make sure that we are not producing an environment that leads to forced disclosures, which can lead to the, uh, to the, uh, to the impact that Matthew just described. So again, what we're working on, what we're working towards is to build a secondary testing protocol, which then allows the gay industry to have standardized testing, as well as allows performers or people who are living with HIV to be performers in an environment where everybody is clear on the science around that and makes an active choice to either participate or to not participate in that environment. And so we would never go against something that is based on informed consent. The reality is just that we as an industry, by excluding people, living with HIV, from being allowed to have a standardized testing protocol, and by shunning and shaming them, we create a social environment that disrupts our community, that pulls our community apart, and that is incredibly dangerous to the people that should be, that we as, as, as a community should be working together with consensually. Thank you. Mostly about binary male, female, and gay. We talk nothing about transgender. 
And I want to understand if you know any studies on specifically transgender men, myself being in this industry, I'm completely different when it comes to uh, my, my uh, possibility of contracting HIV or AIDS because of certain situations. So this is something that we don't want to talk about in our industry. We have a large transgender population in that movement. So we don't, do we separate them and put them as women and as men? But not necessarily because we also have a we're different. You understand my question? So have you done studies on HIV yeah. trans men? Yeah. And do we have these studies? So, so we as a world, the global HIV community, suck at trans research. Yeah. We, I have, I serve as the co-chair of one of the major research networks in the US, and we just greenlit our first study that includes trans men in 2018. Well, at least so we are slowly collecting the data on trans men. Trans women, we have more data on and are collecting more data, but it is somewhere where we're really bad. Um, we're just finally starting having drug companies start releasing what are drug drug interactions with hormones, but otherwise we just have to go with body parts and hope that our potential understanding of body parts works the same. Um, but it doesn't always work the same, and it's it, it is a good question about kind of figuring it out, but it. It is somewhere we are lacking, and I can say there are people working on it, but it, it's a disservice, and it's it's bad. Um, and it goes in the same way for women in HIV as well. So we're, we kind of figured out some things about men, and then, then called it straight, and our cisgender men called it good. Like, Woo, let's go now! And we're now coming back and like, oh shit, that's what else. Um, so we think you can bring the voice to the world, um, we're doing work. They run it. I can also like point in the direction of like some smaller studies and some things that are like happening and very slowly taking off. So I wanted just to ask, um, other than having discussions like this today, what can people in the industry do to reduce the stigma? And I'll, I'll throw one example out there. Think about the words you use, like when you say I'm clean or disease free. These have implications. So, do you have other ideas uh, uh, where we can help reduce the stigma? Um, that's a huge one. Like that is like my biggest pet peeve on Twitter. When people are like, "Clean test, I'm clean." Um, it's just like it, it grosses me out in a very visceral way. But I think that like the most important thing that we can do is like we can talk about this like outside of this room and smaller groups. You know, like you hear people make terrible jokes. Like you hear people make like. Jokes about stigma, jokes about, you know, being HIV positive when the Charlie Sheen debacle was happening. It was like a hoo hoo ha ha. And it's, we've really just got to change the narrative. Um, I'm sure that like everyone in this room actually knows an HIV positive person. Um, and I would encourage you to like, wherever you go in the rest of your life, like behave like that person's in the room with you. Um, and then just talk about this, like with your partners and with your friends. Like, I, I know a lot of men don't talk about testing outside of the industry. So, like, with like your boyfriends outside the industry, just be like, hey, let's talk about HIV. Do you know about prep? I can help you get on prep. Um, I've gotten like ten people on prep in the last month. Um, so, just beginning to start that narrative, normalizing this, and realizing that like. HIV is not a fucking death sentence anymore. And I think once we get that idea out of our head, that fear goes away. Like, I am much more concerned with, like, influenza, hepatitis C, a mosquito bite. Like, those are the things that I'm, like, genuinely more concerned with than HIV. It is, like, a pill a day, live forever. Most people, if they have access to care and they stay on it, become undetectable in, like, a month. It's fucking incredible. So just like reframing how you speak about it, but speak about it. Speak about it loud, speak about it often. Because with this change in government and with Boston SESTA, we've seen so many rises in HIV because a lot of sex workers are doing things they normally would not do. So just have this as part of the narrative. Like if you hang out with me, I was with Ian the other night at 3 a.m. talking about Boy to Gay Bar, about prep and activism. Just talk about it all the time until it's fucking normal. And I would just add to that, um, all of that, and then, you know, what I would say is interrogate their fears about it and think about, you know, why, why, if you're afraid of it, like why, like Matthew was saying, what, you know, what exactly are you, are you afraid of and does it, does the, does your fear match what the actual risk is? And how many performers in here, how many of y'all have ever 
really worried about catching influenza on set. And you know how easy that is to get, like kissing, like just kissing or shaking hands or something like that, and you can get it. It's, it's that easy to get. And like ringworm, that was it, scary last year. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, we, we, you know, we're not having like panels on influenza prevention, you know, and I hope you all got your flu shot. But, um, but the, the last thing I would add, and this is, um, you know, it's in some ways kind of sad, but it, you know, it's the way it is. You gotta remember that a lot of people in the world get their sex ed from you. And so, you know, it's, which is, you know, not that bad. Um, but um, you gotta be, I, I, would, I would urge you to remember that as a responsibility when it comes to like sexual health. Um, and stigma and things like that. Um, people are going to be watching what you do and how you and you know how the industry handles this stuff. And um, I think that is very very important. Um, that's the reason that I'm here. I mean, I think this is very important, um, not just for the health of the of the performers, which I think is incredibly important, but um, you know just the health of the people that are watching your films. Um, and I like I, I have a couple questions for the audience. Um, if you guys feel comfortable like answering these publicly, um, are you, can you raise your hand if you're afraid of having sex with an undetectable HIV positive performer? Okay. Um, huh? medication. You know, it's just like you do so many irresponsible people in the industry. You know, so many people are on <clears throat> medications, drugs, and whatever. I don't know what they, you know, what they have to. That's, that's, that's my thing. That's the reason why we like to have the producer check on the test and not like the talent. You know. okay. That's the, I'm, I'm all for the past class system. Yeah. I'm all for what you guys try to do. I just would like to have kind of a warranty, a response producer that is helpful <coughs> for, for the action. You know? Because the former colors really like all responsible. And then the gentleman, you raise your hand too. Where's your fear coming from? I, I just think it's, it's one of those things that it's, it's a. We haven't had to worry about it before, but you know, the, the detectable and undetectable situation. If we have to pass on system, we don't know if it's a true negative or if it's just undetectable. So they're the same thing. Yeah, it, it says that you can't get it, but there's still a the CDC says it's science. Yeah, it has it's so, I mean, it just it, 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 it wrong. I have the wrong No, it's not. I'm just like, there's no. It's not a right wrong. I'm just trying to understand the where the views are coming from. Yeah. Like right now, you're negative, but you could be undetectable and still have it the next week. I had all the pussy I wanted 
She sucked all the dick she wanted. Oh. My wife fucked all we wanted. Sometimes we used condoms, sometimes we didn't. I made sure I didn't have a open belt before we had sex. I never contracted shit because you don't contract it from somebody who is, uh, uh, who, who is, uh, uh, who has a, a zero, uh, no viral load. She, we got, she got regular tests to make sure that she was uh, low up and viral load. It was always um, safe. Uh, safe sex with an HIV positive person is possible without fucking condoms, okay? Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Sorry. In the back. Just to be respectful, in the back. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to raise a point, not, it's not really a question, but just something that I don't know that we consider, right? We're here today talking about how we should consider HIV as something safer than the flu and not right? But then we're always trying to promote this idea that we need to get back to the risk of threat. Aren't those kind of competing narratives in a way? Because in a way, you want, if you're a your monitor, in a sense, making HIV this safe thing, there's no incentive that people are really about press as, as a preventative measure, right? None of us are taking a daily, you know, vitamin C dose and anybody in this room to prevent it, you know, the cold. So, like, shouldn't we figure out how to make it? Yeah, so the way I always explain it to people, because I see a lot of people that are in serious discord of relationships with people that are, you know, like their partner is in our HIV clinic and I know that they are undetectable. And I explain to them, you know, like you're, you're already in a really safe situation. But, you know, it's kind of like seat belts and airbags. You know, so the thing about PrEP is that it puts the protection, that, that puts a, the power of protection in your hand. And a lot of people feel really comfortable about that. And it's, you know, it's, if you're on PrEP, then, you know, it really doesn't matter if the person you're having sex with is detectable, because then you're, you're protected regardless. So it's, it's kind of a... You know, you're yeah, you're you're completely safe if you're having sex with somebody who's undetectable. But um, if you don't trust that in any way, get on breath. Thank you. How does prep actually work in the body to help take the viral load down? <laughs> yeah, I can. It's, yeah, it's okay. so. PrEP is a, so the, the drug that is used for PrEP is a drug that is also used to treat HIV. And it basically just blocks the replication of the virus so that if, if um, you get the virus in your body, it just doesn't replicate in your body eliminates it. So, you never, so it never establishes an infection. Any more questions? Yeah. I was just gonna ask if there was other questions on the form that you guys can put on the We a we did get a question about uh criminalization. Uh and wondering in California and what kind of the change in the law. So California recently modernized their JD criminalization law. So in California and a number of other states, about 32? Uh 32, 37. In that match. Uh, it is criminal to not disclose one's HIV status, whereas proof of did you disclose is a fun little game of he said, she said, or she said, she said, or he said, he said, or they said, they said. Uh, it's not actually helpful in how they came to be. So a number of states have been modernizing the laws. So California made the decision, uh, Iowa has done this, Colorado has done this, Georgia is working on this, Florida is working on this, Virginia is working on this, but to change the law from a felony to a misdemeanor. Uh, and one of the things that we had found with the California law and in Tennessee, you guys have to share something in common, is that most people who had gotten caught up by the California law were actually uh, street-based sex workers who were compelled to take an HIV test and then double-charged. Um, so that was kind of problematic. 
uh, they fix that. But it is a, an ongoing fight. HIV remains one of the few communicable diseases that we have imagination that there are people who are trying to run around and spread it, and so we created separate laws for it. Um, but that, that's not really actually the case. Um, and you can prosecute people who are trying to do harm to people under other existing criminal law without having any specific law. I'm going to talk. That's okay. Yeah. Um, I also wanted to thank you guys for the panel. Um, uh, and I appreciate you looking at this panel and not knowing the subject matter very well, uh, but at least gave you to learn something, so I think that's amazing. So my question is, for the, uh, the thousands of people who are not in this room, who are on the specifically straight time industry, which I find um, ridiculously under um, aware of this subject, um, how do we reach out to them? Because there's not unaware in this room, but at least they came to learn something. So what are the rest? She doesn't want to read the opinion.com. <laughs> this story in particular. Um, I'll say something to that. So for us, this is um, the trust. This is a start. Uh, we wanted to have an open forum, and I also don't want anybody to feel attacked, their, uh, their thoughts discounted. That is not FSC's mission for us. It's important that we can have a conversation, we can start a conversation, and um, we, can, we, can start, we can start to communicate and to negotiate. And we can find paths forward together. So for us, this is for us. This panel is a start for the two at the leadership conference at Los Angeles uh, last week. Um, uh, we also had a large panel about HIV. Um, we are working on revamping the past front end so that there is a substantial amount of sexual health education hosted on it. We're also discussing ways of you know these fabulous people. Um, David came from Atlanta. Matthew flew in from DC. Um, we're obviously a nonprofit, so we can't do that every day. But uh, but uh, we're also discussing ways of having webinars or other things. So um, there 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 will be more efforts towards this, and uh, um, I'll I'll leave it at that. So you mentioned the laws about HIV and disclosure, and we all know in California it's only a misdemeanor or you can pass it. In the other states, where it is still considered law, whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony, to not disclose your status, how are we dealing with the fact that you're basically breaking the law by showing up to set up your artists and not sharing that status? Um. You know, I, I I don't believe in a lot of legal systems. You know, it was um, slavery was legal, and lynching was legal, and the Holocaust was very legal. And a lot of these laws that we have are very archaic and from the 1980s. Um, the ramifications of being an HIV person and being outed and all of the things that you have to deal with with that, especially as a sex worker in this industry, I, I personally feel are a much bigger pill to swallow than having to like worry about walking on set and being illegal. And I don't believe that humans are illegal. Like, and there's hypocrisy there too because you know if you are law abiding and you listen to Measure B, you wear a condom for every scene you do in LA County, but nobody fucking does that. <laughs> so. Uh, I don't think people are too concerned about laws. Um, yeah. So uh, currently, for both the past plus time, but for the scenes I have to book next week, right? I have to book. I pick one performer and their uh, uh, undetected, right? And then so now I'm in, I'm in a spot because I'm like, look, well, he's past system to get, you know, to handle the testing for the shoot. So I can ask him and the next person, hey, are you cool to, to test it? It's a bareback animal shoot. Are you cool to test it? Shoot, you're gonna have to show each other your test. Um, now, now I have to mandate that, right? Or is, is there, now I guess what I'm getting at is, what, what's the way to do that currently? If the, fir the first performer you book is uh, undetectable, how do you pick a partner ethically without, you don't want to out the first person, but you gotta, you can't use passes, right? So what, what are you supposed to do? 
Sorry, I keep grabbing the microphone. I didn't mean to do this. Um, that's that's an incredibly good question, and that's exactly why it's really, you know, I've been at FOC for three years, and it takes a long time to try and find ways of a lot of conversations with performers. Um, on the gay side of the industry, uh, sorry, let me finish that sentence first, to, to talk to performers, to talk to studios, to look at the law. Um, we also have to build systems that work all over the United States, um, and we're now starting to branch out with the past system into, into Canada. So we don't ever want to create a system where we're in breach of the law, so it, it takes a lot, and that's why PASS was designed, it was designed the way it was designed, because it doesn't carry medical information in that sense. Um, now, uh, as a, so on the gay side of the industry, um, uh, there's, a, there's a great way of communication between people. And um, uh, I, under, I understand your frustration where you're sitting here as a producer or a director at that point, and you're like, how do I introduce this conversation? Because I don't want to, I don't want to out somebody. Um, and the reason why you don't want to out somebody is because you also understand the stigma that is still living against people living with HIV and the miseducation or the misinformation that is living. So I think that this is part of an effort of alleviating that. And um, uh, I'm happy to sit down with you uh, in different ways and maybe talk with um, other gay studios and see how they do it. Um, but also a lot of performers that are HIV positive on the, on the gay side, they're very open to it. To their, to their other gay counterparts because they understand that the performers themselves are knowledgeable about it. Um, it. It becomes that awkward gray zone when that is not the case. So I think we're working on it from our direction. I'm happy to sit down and have a longer conversation, um, especially with some, with some of the folks on the panel. Um, are there any more questions? We're like at the 5.30 mark. Mr. Pam. <laughs> Conversation, and I don't know if that's illegal for me to be talking about it or not. But you know, I asked the performer if you want to be a something positive, negative. You know, what's your choice? And I think the more we talk about status and people are open about their status, that helps reduce the stigma. So not talking about it actually isn't. Okay. That's my and that's, and, that's, and that's a good point too. And I think it's also about whether it's comfortable for the other for the other performers. And that's that's a negotiation that uh, for you you have practiced and and sort of you know you've, you've built a rapport. And so we're trying to build a system around that and making it possible to have that conversation um, and to provide that education. We are at the five thirty mark. Are there? Um, uh, I, I keep saying that. Um, so I don't want to stop the panel, but I do want to stop the panel um, because we kind of have to. Uh, what I wanted to say is, um, I've had HIV positive partners. My one of my current partners is HIV positive, living living with HIV, undetectable. I take pre exposure prophylaxis. Um, one of the things that we didn't touch on fully is. I do that because then I'm in charge of my body and my partner isn't the one that feels like I have to protect you and it, and it has changed the way that our relationship works because I take care of myself, he takes care of himself and it, it just alleviates a lot of barriers. What I want and what I'm hoping for, for everybody that has sat in this room for the last hour and a half, especially the first half hour where we're trying to get Wi-Fi, um, is that you can walk out of this room and know that it's our intent here today was to start a conversation, to provide knowledge, and to empower people to make the choices that are best for them in, in their situation. Nobody wants to force somebody to do something that they don't want to do. What our intent is, is to make sure that the information that Dr. Holland, Bella, uh, Charlotte, and Matthew, and so many others in this field carry around every day, also permeates our industry so that our industry can have a good dialogue about it and make good informed choices. Understanding how risks work, understanding how prevention options work, and making sure that you can choose for yourself because your body, it's your body and it's your choice. And so I hope that you can walk away with this today. I hope that we can continue this dialogue. Um, there were moments today when I was sitting in the back and I was crying little happy tears because um, this is an incredibly important dialogue. And as an industry, we can change a whole lot. And we have an incredible amount of power. We're an incredibly powerful community. And if we can find the way to have a fact-based and respectful conversation with each other, then we can change a lot for the better for all of us. So I want you to keep with that. Thank you. Um, you can follow our
I'm not a social media person, but I know everybody else is. So um, we actually have the Twitter handles for our panelists on the bio page. So our panelists will be happy to possibly continue conversations. Um, if you have other questions, I'm always available. My team is always available. Thank you. Thank you.